Hello. Um, sorry to break up all these uh, conversations and uh, after 23 years with WWF, I, I know how hard it is to, to do that with pandas. Um, so um, we'll have plenty of time afterwards to talk, um, but I just wanted to welcome everyone to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand. Uh, my name is Lee Poston. I am a communications advisor for the WWF Greater Mekong program and an FCCT board member. Um, so happy everybody's here. And um, I, uh, I wanted to start off before we introduce the, uh, the panelists and the, and the issue tonight with just a few uh, upcoming events. Um, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me. tomorrow night is a really good one. It's a, a dinner buffet and panel discussion edible bugs, protein of the future. So it will be, it will be a buffet. There will be edible bugs for, for uh, here. If any of you WWF folks are here, you should come here. I don't know if anybody noticed, but it's in the multifunctional utility. I had a little insect who worked there. Nice, nice, nice. Um, and, and, and actually, Reagan, many of you know Reagan from WWF. She, she opened one of the first insect uh, restaurants here in Bangkok. So. Um, so that should be a good one. That's tomorrow night at 6.30 to 10 p.m. Um, Monday night, we have a great film, Blue, also an environmental film um, from the Australian Embassy, um, a documentary about um, changes happening to our ocean, its marine life, and how that impacts humankind. Um, and I'm going to give a shout out to, uh, to my other, uh, my colleagues uh, on rivers as well. Um, next Tuesday, 6 to 8 p.m., silencing the Mekong, the making of Zyobury Dam from commencement to operations. Should be a really interesting one next Tuesday, um, looking at, at the Zyobury Dam, the first dam on the lower stretch uh, of the Mekong. Um, so a critical one for what we're going to talk about tonight as well. Um, and then... Uh, Next Friday, we have a really interesting panel discussion, an evening with Charles Dickens and Mark Twain. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a play. Um, I just heard about, about this where um, Dickens and Twain go head-to-head -head with exercise, extracts from their legendary works, A Christmas Carol to Oliver Twist, to Huckleberry Finn and The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And then they'll have a, um, anecdotes, letters, and a lively Q&A with the audience afterwards. Um, so you can find all of these on um, all of these events. We have many more on the FCCT website. So um, let's get to the, um, to the event. And while I'm introducing them, if uh, the panelists can go ahead and, um, and, and join us at the table, that would be great. Um, so tonight's um, subject is, is river deltas. Um, and the reason that, that, that many of these folks are here is for a regional... Um, conference on uh, river deltas, um, and it's centered around something called resilient Asian deltas, which you're going to hear about from from Stuart um, and from several others. They're looking at how we can protect and make resilient to climate change the most important river deltas around the world, um, deltas that are home to over 400 million people and and biodiversity. You know, uh, Irrawaddy dolphins, giant catfish. Um, but they're they're in in real uh, they're really struggling right now um, with climate change, with sea level rise, with sedimentation, with sand mining, with issues like that. Um, so the panelists tonight um, we have a real eclectic mix. Um, we have Stuart Orr, who is WWF's global freshwater lead and an expert on rivers and freshwater ecosystems, um, and also he's an authority on private sector water stewardship and innovative financial solutions. Um, then um, we will go to um, next, uh, because he has, to he has to leave early, unfortunately, um, Dr. Seri uh, Subtharatit, um, Senior Director of the Center on Climate Change and Disaster at Rangsit University and a leading voice on the Bangkok sinking issue. You have to leave at 7.45, right? Yes. So I think we're actually going to have you go first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if we can change, sorry, Shannon. Um, so we will have um, the good doctor go first. Um, Peter Jackson, who is um, director at, Lo at Lockton Watana, Thailand's largest insurance broker, and is a, a real expert and an advisor for some of Thailand's largest corporations on risk management. Um, and then we have um, Kachakorn uh, Varakom. I hope I pronounced that okay. 
um, who is uh, CEO of Porous City Network, um, a leader in helping cities create climate resilient urban spaces. And some of you may be familiar with one of her biggest projects that I won't say anything about because she's going she's gonna to talk about it. Um, but uh, has a great TED talk as well afterwards. Uh, if you go on, online and you can you can find that TED talk. So I'm not I'm going to uh, go ahead and turn it over to um, to Dr. Um, Subtaratet. So um, and he will unfortunately have to leave once he presents. Uh, so he won't be here for Q and A. But he's going to talk about the local um, angle. Go ahead. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Actually, uh, I presented in, uh, yeah, yesterday morning already. Yeah, but at least uh, I would like to share your uh, idea so about the, the future solutions. Uh, I will talk about the uh, main is uh, in Bangkok. Okay, what happened in Bangkok? Okay, uh, uh, of course. Uh, as a, I'm an engineer, yeah, I'm a civil engineer, so we have been experienced in flood during the last maybe more than 60 years. There's so many, uh, at least four or five big flood attack Bangkok, okay? So we come to the, this speaker uh, in order to show you that. I don't have the... Oh. Okay, okay, this one, huh? No, 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 just use the arrows. No, no, I mean, pointer, something like that. The pointer? No, this pointer? No, no, this is a wireless mouse. Wireless mouse, okay. Okay, it's just a pointer. Actually, it's a wireless mouse. Okay, so this is the the first one is that the first step is like a, we have to cross the three steps. The first one is that urban farming. Of course, in Bangkok, we make analysis of rainfall. Maximum one day rainfall. This is for the last 30 years, this is only the last 10 years. That, uh, the previous record of rainfall means that the maximum one day rainfall is increased. Increased. Just mean of course, you have the problem of urban flooding. If you, you came to Thailand last month or last two months, uh, you will see this kind of situation. Hold. Okay? So, uh, I just try. Oh no. I cannot work. Okay, as is at least a video. Okay. Yeah, you try. Okay. The second, this one is picture is that we make a forecast in the future, near future, mid future, and far future. This is the scenario, that this is the uh, uh, business as usual scenario. You see, it's increasing. The more future, the more lane phones, something like that. Okay. This one, we have to face, we cannot avoid it unless we have to improve the drainage system. But still now, cannot, still now, and not have the policy to do that. The second step is that the big flood, such kind of 2011, yeah, this is the big first one here. So if you see Bangkok is located here, and then the basin is about 170,000 kilometers square. Yeah. All the lanes formed in the upstream have to go down, have to pass Bangkok. They have to pass Bangkok. So we make analysis for the landfall as in the rainy season for a six month landfall. Uh, actually, start from uh, May to October, six months. Yeah. The 2011 is about 60 year return period. The left one here, you see, is uh, the amount of rain is about 1,400 millimeter. Okay. We make a forecast in the future, next 30 years. The 1,400 millimeter, the same amount, is will be only 10 years return period. Yeah. That means 
we have to face with uh, more frequency of big flood like uh, 2011. Okay. No. But cannot see. Uh, you see in the picture, cannot see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's why the Thai people doesn't uh, aware this kind of big fast because uh, they say that oh every f 50 years or uh, it's uh, my life it will be one time something like that but in the future it may come every 10 years such a big fast okay uh, of course as you know very well that the damage uh, the loss is uh, if I remember the, 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 the in terms of economic loss is about 1.4 trillion trillion dollars something like that yeah right so the last one the last step is uh, we are really concerned with this situation because as I am a IPCC list author for this the more the, the time pass yeah, the analysis of the data is uh, more uh, more clear uh, instead of clearer scientific base evidence base and uh, more uh, computer capacity something that it makes more accuracy something like that so just i think this one can have the animation i don't know Stop. this one ah. no? it's coming. Oh, coming okay yeah very really, it's really slow really <laughs> so actually i i did is uh, for the next 30 year flood will be like this something like that the flood will come uh, okay coming like this okay also uh, of course uh, sea level rise is one of the main factors and then uh, the rainfall in the upstream also the increase next 30 year how much I input to this model and then make it to make all the people here awareness of this kind of flood how to solve this problem this is uh, my uh, my 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 research. Okay. Yes. Okay. Of course, this picture show is very really complicated. Yeah, in terms of the man-made from start from the 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 red uh, rectangular here, yeah? deforestation also in the upstream. There's no forest at all, and then urbanization make a more uh, high discharge to to Bangkok under cloud pumping. Uh, as you know, last 30 years, we have about 20 centimeter per year subsidence. But now the less is about 1 to 2 centimeter per year. So because uh, we enact, last about 15 years, we enact the law. Bangkok and Metropolitan, we cannot uh, underground pumping. But of course, uh, underground water cost is very really cheap. Right? So how the government can go to see uh, every hotel, every big company used or not, right? You don't know, actually, yeah, you don't know. But, but still, the, 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 the law is uh, uh, on that already. So, dam construction also. Of course, you know very well that it trapped the sediments. Right? You can see later that we have the erosion problem in Bangkuntian, okay? Uh, both of the man-made, right? Like, we can uh, select as a socio-economic developments and occur, of course, from the nature, okay. climate change, climate variability, or sea level rise. Okay. This, this component is very important because uh, somebody says that, okay, uh, if you don't concern about vulnerability or exposure, you just, for example, for the uh, UNFCCC meeting and try to 184 countries like try to deliver the gas emission just we try to leave the they the hazards but how about the, this one these two circles or so this is important so it's make more red one here this is the risk yeah? it make a larger okay so that means it's three components is equal importance okay Next one. So, concerns about the Thai Gulf, Thai Upper Gulf here, the average relative sea level rise from the data is about 1.2 cent, seven centimeter per year. You see, most contribution. If you see the figure here, 
is this uh, due to subsidence. Let as I told you, one to two cent allow this one. Right? If one centimeter already, that means the the left one is from the sea level rise, yeah? about two to three million meter per year only. This uh, according to the IPCC, that the global mean sea level is about two to three millimeter per year. At least. But now uh, we also have the problem of subsidence about one one centimeter per year, something like that. Okay. Uh, compared to the other coastline, is a is a, normally is a is a sand or a lock. Something is a under sand is a lock, and then but the upper tide curve is almost the cohesive sediment is clay, right? So I I make this figures in order to to try to to warning the people a warning to the government that. If you don't do anything, eh? 2050, it will be like a nearly one meter, about 0.8 something, and then 2100 is about two meters. Right? This is the result from the AR6, is assessment list report 6, which will release in next two years. Next two years. Uh, you see the first speaker here, you have the uh, uh, RCP 2.6, 4.5, 8.5. 8.5 is the business as usual now. Right? So the results of this research, you show that this is for the one of the uh, updated results. Uh, research. Uh, we have last seven years before, we have assessment five. You see? As I told you, the more the time pass, and the more accuracies and the more uh, evidence based coming, coming. Eh? So it shows that the upper bound of the updated research is more than last seven years report. Right? This means extreme is more extreme. It's like that. Extreme is more extreme, something like that. Right? This is the last one that will be released in next two years, ARC. In the 2001, in Thailand, I include the uh, uh, subsidence or education already. It's about, as I told you before, it's about nearly two meters here. So here, the cloud level here is about 1.7, 1.6 meter MSL, mean sea levels. See? Here, the location of the FCCC here. So. You see this one, it's about nearly two meter. Right? Again, you will come here to have a good dinner by ship, you will have to go by boat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the next to have a right? next time. If if you don't if we don't do anything about this one. Right? So as a okay if we plot in terms of the, the sea level lies, you see, this is a Bangkok. This is Bang Kun Tian, 4.7 kilo here. Uh, the, the white one is here, less than 30 years. Eh? The sea level lies and the subsidence to Kesu, uh, we make it like this one. For the less than 80 years, it should be this one. So, we seen, don't have any master plan to do this, we still don't have. Just only illusions problem only. We have uh, different coastal structure to prevent illusion, but the such kind of structure they don't prevent the sea level rise, right? Such kind. So we have to learn from your countries. You have to. We have to learn from Netherlands. We have to learn from many, many countries that how to solve this problem. Oh, I just finished because I have 10 minutes. Okay? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Th thank you so, so much. Yeah. Do you have time for one question? Yes, yes. You have yeah. any questions? Do yeah. you have to leave? Does anybody have a question? Yeah. Who, I, I, I will ask, who of you as were here during the last 2011 flood. 
Oh, so many. So you know, you know very well uh, about the situation, right? You stay in the flood inundation area. You stay in the flood area. Oh, where? What? As I, I cannot understand. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, and you. So, next 10 years, it's just kind of that flood will come again. Okay. So, we have to think. Yeah. Okay, please, welcome. Okay. Questions. Okay. okay, well, thank you so much. And, um, I, you know, thankfully we're on the penthouse level here, so that gives us a little bit of breathing room, but... Uh, <laughs> Those are some really uh, dramatic uh, statistics, and I, I, I'm, I wish you could stay longer because I, I know we'd have lots of questions for you, but, um, but I, I really appreciate it. <clears throat> um, so I think now we'll move from, from Bangkok to the global picture um, with, uh, with Stuart, and um, Stuart Orr, leader of WWF's global um, freshwater practice. Um, Okay, thanks Lee. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, that was a really interesting presentation. My name is Stuart Orr, I am the lead of uh, WWF's freshwater practice. Um, our freshwater practice is about 500 people in 65 countries uh, and with a very strong presence in this part of the world. So uh, offices in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, uh, but also India, Pakistan. Uh, and, and above. I, I mention those countries because they fit under uh, the vision of our program on resilient Asian deltas. Uh, we have been working a long, long time in this part of the world on uh, river systems, on hydropower, on fisheries, on planning. Um, but over the last few years, we have focused our attentions uh, to deltas for a number of reasons. And among those reasons are these top line statistics. Uh, that this part of the world is, is home to uh, a very large global population, um, some, some of the largest cities in the region, uh, huge populations, and we've just seen from Bangkok uh, some of the repercussions of that. But also we find in many of these deltas highly productive economic uh, activities, very strong contributions to GDP in, in many of the countries. Um, from a from our perspective, from a WWF perspective, very high biodiversity. Um, I think that's a, a, a very uh, conservative number of fish species. Some of these river systems like the Irrawaddy, uh, who have only recently been doing fish studies in the last five or six years, have identified I think over 200 endemic fish alone in some of these river systems. Um, they're also very productive ecosystems. These are the fish and rice bowls of, of, of this part of the world. And many of you who have visited these deltas have seen the way in which these systems are set up and the impacts that they, they have and will have. And of course, we're here, and I think the world is talking more about climate change. Uh, and while climate is not the only thing to focus on, it's a pretty big stressor to these already vulnerable systems. So uh, conservative estimates value major deltas worldwide at trillions of US dollars in terms of the revenue they provide through their ecosystem services things that don't necessarily fit very well in market economics, but are nonetheless appreciated by, by all of us who, uh, who understand those kinds of, those kinds of services. Uh, in recently, in New York, just a few weeks ago, there was the big climate summit. It was sort of the, the gathering of, of the world to come around and, and, and wring their hands one more time about the lack of action and, and discuss what the commitments were going to be going forward. And certainly, deltas became uh, a, one of those areas that people were paying attention to. There was a big report that was put out by the IPCC that I believe the professor was referring to as well, uh, which says this, with high confidence the world's deltas will face very high, high to very high risks from rising sea levels, even under scenarios where the world rapidly reduces emissions. So it was in this report, particularly in chapter four of this report, where they explicitly started to talk about sediment and rivers and the connection of delta systems to decisions 
that have long been made upstream. And I think for the first time, it really uh, validated in many ways why we have shifted our focus away from very complex transboundary water management discussions to more deltaic ones, because we feel that we can get action moving within countries, within cities, with mayors, with communities around issues such as sinking or drowning cities, as the professor has said, food security, uh, economic uh, activities, et cetera, et cetera. But we already know that these areas are already facing some extreme uh, impacts. We know that Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Thailand, for example, very low-lying deltas are already, already within the categorization of the most uh, vulnerable countries in the world to climate change. And I think, again, the professor's statistics showing that the mean is four times higher for the Bay is evidence of that. We've also seen uh, tropical storm impacts over the last um, decade or so. Um, once again, showing a couple of things. One, people are vulnerable. People living in deltas, many of them, do not have the ability uh, to manage the risks. And also that these deltas are places where people want to be because they are productive, because they offer economic opportunities, because they offer uh, so much in the sense of, uh, of livelihoods. Uh, again, the, the, the conversation we've just had over the, uh, the uh, floods in the city, and as, as you said, some people in this room had lived through that occasion. But of course, we've seen flooding in other river deltas recently, uh, Irrawaddy, uh, of course. And we know that uh, we, are, we are facing in the uh, Mekong Delta in particular, uh, many threats upstream and downstream. So I think we all have the sense of, of the global picture of, of, of the challenges. Um, but certainly it looks uh, like this. And I think it's really important to state that, you know, many of these um, incidents uh, are put down to climate change. And I think sometimes that's fair. But sometimes we have to also realize that the reason that so many villages are sliding into the Mekong in Vietnam is because of illegal sand mining. Because the sand is being drenched out without any regulation and it's making these communities extremely vulnerable. Of course, we also have these um, uh, uh, structures that are lost to the sea, which make for very dramatic photographs, of course, and really drive the point home. And of course, iconic pictures such as this of uh, I believe this is the monastery down further down south of, of Bangkok, um, highlighting the point that uh, assets are vulnerable. And of course, the science tells us that the global scale of delta sinking and shrinking is unprecedented. And I think that those two terms are very important, sinking and shrinking. So we talk about sea level rise, which is the encroachment of, of the sea into the deltas, but we don't talk as much about the loss of sediment down the rivers that keep deltas alive. Deltas are nothing more than enough mud and sand and gravel to push the tide away and create a deltaic system. The word delta is obviously from the Greek for triangle and deltas look like triangles. Mm. They are forces of nature and they need entire and continuous replenishment of sediment from upstreams. Let's just keep that in mind for a second. Oops. The Global Commission for Adaptation is a, a, a very important uh, institution that has been set up in the last few years to bring a real highlight to the uh, issues of adaptation and what that means to the global economy. And in their recent report uh, that came out in New York, again, trying to help us to funnel and channel our, our, our efforts and our financing, uh, they also highlighted Delta and coastal systems as highly vulnerable uh, to, to these issues. But again, you can see, as I showed before, the discussion is really around rising seas. So deltas can only exist, as I said, where that discharge occurs. So while we say all the time in the news that these are exposed to high sea level rise, and they are, no doubt, there's a lot of awareness around that fact. What there's a lot less understanding about is that sand and mud is disappearing, that it simply is not making it down these deltaic systems because of decisions we have been making over many years. We've tried to bring some attention to this by bringing uh, the value of rivers back into a conversation. Uh, the point being here that we're trying to, um, uh, around the world, uh, get people to understand river systems as very complex and dynamic, of course, but they are more than just sources of waters. They are not batteries. They are not sewers. They are not conveyor pipes. They are extremely complex but vitally important systems from the very top to the very bottom. And the deltas are a living example of what happens when we don't value our systems correctly. If you look at the science, you will see that in some locations, 90% of the uh, traditional or the expected sediment deltas is not making it to the deltas. 
uh, you can see from the, uh, from the key here, the loss of sediment is uh, differentiated by the color and the size uh, of the circles. And you see that Chow Praia, for example, Irrawaddy, Mekong, Indus, uh, very, very uh, important rivers with many millions of people uh, are, are suffering from, from these effects. So w what is happening? What's happening is that decisions that have been made over the last 30, 40, 50 years uh, to block and dam and divert water upstream, whether that's for hydropower, uh, agricultural multi-purpose dams, small dikes, weirs, whatever, add that to sand mining and dredging, and suddenly you have uh, a recipe for disaster. And that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing the consequences of many years of, uh, of single-minded decision-making. To be honest with you, those of us who have been trying to work with planners to put hydropower or dams in the right place have really struggled for many years because of the political nature of, of, of the issue, uh, because of the, uh, uh, well, let, let's say, let's be open about this, because of the corruption opportunities uh, and because of the, uh, the very fact that these were big sort of legacy projects by, by politicians. And they undoubtedly, in many cases, delivered development benefits. But we never considered in its entirety the river systems. And in many ways, when you look at the environmental impact assessments of, of many dams, if they even bothered to do them, only ever really looked upstream. And if they looked downstream, they only looked for the next community. They certainly did not look down to the deltas and say, what impact will this have? And we also, so I, I bring up sand mining. It's an extremely important issue that is suddenly... Um, really exploded on the global level. I mean, this is an issue that is, was, I think, raised in this region, has been picked up by the World Economic Forum, the UN. I've certainly heard it more and more. I see it more in the press. Um, it is the largest mining industry in the world. Um, the largest mine site in the world is Dongting Lake in China, uh, which you'd be interested to know. It's not in Chile or uh, in the middle of Canada. Um, and you can see that you need sand for construction. So as we talk about the Belt and Road, as we talk about global construction, that sand has to come from somewhere. And the best sand in the world comes from rivers. And the best gravel comes from rivers. I was in Dubai not long ago, and I was talking to somebody in Dubai, and I was commenting on this issue, and I, I was looking at the size of the expansion of Dubai, and he had to admit to me that the sand they use in Dubai to build their buildings comes from Australia. Imagine that. So this is a huge industry. Uh, much of it is legal. Much of it is possible. A lot of it is illegal. Uh, and uh, I think a lot has to be done uh, politically to make sure that this is done in the right way and is not impacting us. So why are they shrinking? Uh, we've talked about that, but there are other reasons. There's obviously diversions for agriculture, which is extremely important. But again, if done poorly, uh, can have big consequences. And as you know from Jakarta and Bangkok, the issue of subsidence and groundwater pumping is having a significant issue on, on, this, uh, on this again, um, which adds, again, to the complexity of the issue, adds to the perspectives of the issue, um, and, and sort of uh, builds on the challenges in multiple ways. I think that the reason that we're all here, and we have been here for a number of days, and the reason that we're working with so many coalition partners um, is a testament to these challenges. However, I have found uh, in the last uh, couple of years working on this with large institutions, donors, financial institutions, with NGOs, with governments in the region, very willing governments in the region, that people want to um, want to do something about this, that this is becoming an urgent enough issue that they, uh, we hope and we feel from, from this conference here um, that we can, get, uh, we can get some traction. We've put together a strategy that is sort of our guideline and our sort of um, rallying cry. This will uh, obviously look different in all Delta countries. It will be in, uh, informed by the partnerships, by the government, by the willingness, uh, and by the challenges. Um, but our belief is that business as usual will lead to um, a real uh, a poor story for everybody in the end. And we believe that there is a real opportunity beyond the political will uh, to, other, to begin to start to build, build with nature. And there's a huge attention being put on nature-based solutions and investment. And we believe that there's a huge financing opportunity uh, and a lot of global finance moving into climate change, adaptation, and the like. We believe we can divert into these delta systems uh, and deliver some solutions. So this is uh, my last slide. This is really the focus areas for us, the Indus, the Ganges, Meghna, Brahmaputra, the Irrawaddy, the Chow Praia, the Mekong, and the Pearl, we will be working with teams, governments, uh, other NGOs, many financial institutions uh, to try and bring solutions to all of these areas 
um, obviously for very different reasons, but nonetheless, because we all share an interest in um, addressing this issue. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Stuart. And um, I, th I think that's two presentations where we, we've heard the term business as usual and um, terrifying um, um, consequences if we do continue on business as usual. Um, so thank you for that. So I think... Um, that, that one there. No slides. No slides. Okay. Oh, no so slides. so we will go, we'll go to Peter, Great, um, who will discuss... Yep. What, so I no want to do, what I want to do is just talk to you a bit about what came out of the discussion we had today about the role of insurance. Because you may say, what's insurance got to do with deltas? But you can see from particularly the first presentation, how many hundreds of thousands or millions of people in Thailand would suffer with no insurance if there's a flood going on of the level we had in 2011? And I'll come back to that point in a minute. But also, the projects which are going on in deltas need financial protection when things go wrong because you can't stop the weather and we'll t I'll talk a little bit in a minute about weather insurance. Uh, I'm doing this without slides which for me feels like I'm doing it naked but you'd be glad to know <laughs> the image is going no further than that. Um, but what I want to do is ask you all a question. Um, can you put your hand up if you've ever made an insurance claim? Right. Put it down if it was a good experience. <laughs> okay, so um, the problem with insurance, as you're very, very aware of those sorts of claims, is that it's complicated, it takes too long, they ask stupid questions, uh, and you get frustrated, and you don't get what you thought you were going to get. If anybody's got a different experience, I'd be happy. Uh, in our business, we spend a lot of our time fighting with insurance companies to get our clients what they should want. Um, so that means that when you're trying to find solutions for weather-related risks in deltas, that it's difficult because the people need the money now. It's no point. A lot of our claims go on for 18 months, two years. It's too late. They need the money now, particularly if we're insuring farmers or people who've got low incomes and so forth. So I'm going to talk about two aspects of insurance, the good bit and the bad bit. Um, the good bit is that there's a lot of pressure on the global insurance companies to deal with risks that we have in the 21st century. Uh, the insurance industry is very good at being 10 years behind the time of everyone else, but there's a lot of pressure on them to look at particularly at weather-related, climate-related uh, issues. So what you're now getting are solutions coming out primarily of Europe, but they're being implemented in Asia, which are called parametric insurance solutions. And what's driving that is actually very good data. So if you look at the data that uh, Dr. Seri was presenting earlier, he can very, very, in a very granular way, in a very strong way, demonstrate what's happening. And also the insurance companies have spent a huge amount of money understanding historical trends in weather, whether that's typhoon, whether that's flood, whether that's earthquake, etc. So. With the, with the vastly improved data, what insurance companies can now offer are these parametric solutions, which basically means you agree the trigger. So if you say you want to protect rural farmers in a delta against a 1 in 250 year flood event or a 1 in, two, or a one in 500 year um, drought event, you can agree those parameters that, the, that the, the flood or the drought has to reach that trigger. And the moment that trigger is reached for a period of time, doesn't have to be long, maybe only a few days, then the money is paid. No questions asked, no discussion about give me more evidence. The evidence is all based upon sound meteorological data anyway, which is collected by strong third parties. The money gets paid. So we can now, within a matter of weeks, get money to people, as opposed to a matter of months and years and it all being too late. So that's the good side. And that's what we were talking about today, giving examples about how we've, we're looking at typhoon-related risk in China on that, how we're looking at crop-related risk uh, in Asia, uh, uh, developing similar mechanics to help people to manage the extremes. Because by and large, most organizations or groups of people can manage variants, but they can't manage real extremes. So it's helping them protect against those extremes. So that's the good bit. 
The bad bit is if you own a condo in, t in, t in Bangkok, uh, or, or rent a condo like I do. The bad bit is that insurance companies, particularly in Thailand, are getting very, very worried about flood aggregation risks in places like Bangkok. So I was talking today about, we had an insurance company come to us and said, we've got 100 of your clients we don't want to renew the insurance with. So we said, why? And they said, because we're worried about, we would have too much risk in downtown Bangkok. And this is a real issue. Um, and the, therefore, if you're in a condo, if you run a business in Bangkok, you're going to find that your insurance cover is going to get more expensive and a little bit harder to get. Um, because the insurance companies are very worried about the risk. And also, if you look at the huge malls which have been built, like Icon Siam, One Bangkok, which is starting now, the new Dusitani project, getting insurance for those is actually increasingly challenging and more and more expensive because the insurance companies are really worried about, about the risk. And I was talking actually with some of the people in the audience afterwards, and some very good points were made about you can't solve it on an individual case by case. You have to, we have to start looking at a solution for Bangkok that involves the Office of Insurance Commission, that involves the, um, the, the regional government here, and involves the insurance companies so that we can find a solution that allows them to provide adequate insurance and also at the same time doesn't bankrupt them in doing so because I don't think they could deal with another 2011. So global picture, better solutions coming out to help uh, organize, uh, people deal with weather related risks. On the other side of it, on a local basis, when it comes down to the nitty gritty of ensuring businesses, infrastructure, people against flood risk, it's getting more and more challenging for insurers who've had more and more losses. Every year we have to manage lots of losses in Thailand down to flood. Whether that's a 7-Eleven store getting flooded or a steel mill getting flooded, you know, we have those sort of issues and it gets, it gets worse and worse. So we've got to start finding some partnerships about this which allow us to provide that because at the end of the day, the role of insurance in all this is giving people money to get back on their feet. And if they can't do that, it becomes a big problem. And Asia already is underinsured. You know, you look at the proportion of risk that Asia has to bear without insurance is a lot higher than, say, Europe or, or North America. So we have a real challenge about that we have to start to address. Um, so how do we start to deal with that? Um, if we look at it on an entity or business level, then one of the things we were talking about today was for people who are managing projects and deltas, risk management becomes really important. And it's actually both a, a risk prevention element, but it's also a sales point. And we'll come on to the sales point in a minute. But the risk, the risk management element is that very rarely do people in an organization get together to talk about what could go wrong. We're always talking about what can go right and how we're going to beat next year's target or achieve this goal or whatever. And that's all great because that's what drives us on. But very rarely do we get together and go, you know what, if the wheels fell off, what, it, what would it look like? And some of the work we do is with organizations where we get people from different functions together and we start talking about, okay, what could go wrong? What almost went wrong? What, we, what have we seen competitors or other organizations suffer from? And how are we managing those risks? And also, how do we transfer some of the financial costs of that out into the insurance industry? Now, that's good best practice as an organization, but it's also help, very helpful for people running projects in deltas where they're trying to get funding because if you talk to financial institutions like we do regularly in fact often we rep we we represent the lender when they're assessing the, the risks um, uh, for various projects then they want to understand how you're going to manage the downside because they want their money to be safe so people who are able to put forward strong risk management strategies are able to help them achieve funding and also it helps them with the lender agreements as well, because often we're working with clients on the lender. So often when we get insurance claims, the people who get the money are the bank, not the client, because the bank's got first right on the assets, so that's where the money goes. So risk management plans, which show how a business manages its, say, top 10 risks, is actually really important. And we think this becomes even more so when you've got a difficult insurance market of the, of the type I've described, but also it helps when you're trying to attract some of these global type solutions that you get. 
uh, from, from the likes of the European insurers who are now providing weather-related uh, risk solutions um, around, around the world. So that's what we're talking about, how insurance can play a role in helping get money back to people who need it quickly. So we've got examples in India and China particularly where you've got integrated insurance solutions, where you've got insurance, you've got access to better farming methods, weather data, and also to improve seed uh, varieties which will deal with... Um, which will deal with drought and so forth. So you can integrate insurance with all these other solutions to come up with a sustainable way of supporting uh, communities and, and projects of the types that we've been looking at today. So that's mine. No slides, nothing too dramatic. But I'm sure you've had more than 10 minutes of insurance now, so I'll let you pass on to a more inspiring story. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. And, um, and cut your corn, do you need to... Yeah, Would you like to the see mouse. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, so we'll hear from, uh, from cut your corn about um, some, some solutions and, and, and some of the things that she's been working on in, in Thailand and, and elsewhere. Hi, my name is Kat, and I'm a landscape architect. I was in the um, conference yesterday. So I try to speak differently because some of you were there. <laughs> so I'm actually growing up in the rural house in Bangkok. And this is the image of how the playgrounds of in front of my house look like. Oops. Yes. So yes, as you can imagine like living in Bangkok is so much not so many public space and especially like trees way back there was but it's become less and less and I have no problem playing in the parking lots as my playground but when I grew up and actually understand how Bangkok grew in this past hundred years from the delta that can breathe and to the land that can absorb water to the concrete jungle and as all the speakers have said that this is the problem because we are the last city to approach all the water to the ocean but we have lost the ability if you compare the city as the body we actually paralyze. We don't have enough rain to circulate our blood because we dump all the canals. We don't know how to breathe because all the city was so concrete. So yes, this is how Bangkok looks like. And when it's rain, only 15 minutes, I'm sure everyone's kind of have experience. Not even when it's rain, but when it's rain, it's getting worse, right? And with the heavy rain and flood, you hear this kind of news, like, <laughs> how could I on the street? <laughs> this is very common. <laughs> yes. So I'm actually growing up with all this thing and thought it's like the common things, that it, but it's getting worse. Like I used to both paddling in the flood water, having fun as a kid, but in a sudden it's become disaster. So this is the, um, the World Economic Forums. Can we have sound? Nope. We, we, sh we should. So is that a sound? Nope. Let's, let me try again. Oops. Okay. Oh, uh, good. Do, do we have sound? Okay, no worries, but I did play this clip video and you can find it in the World Economics Forums. And it's like one minute and it's featured the park that I did and it's called Shula Longkorn Centenary Park. And it's the first public park in 30 years. How old were you when you are 30s? <laughs> I mean in the central Bangkok so it's, it's, it sounds very really normal from the country where you're from but from Bangkok it's such a precious thing that ever happened and 
and it's actually won many award recognition from around the world, from German, from America, from Spain, and yes. But many small recognition in Thailand, like people, what is this park? <laughs> it's very funny. But anyway, so this is the park, and this is Chula Lungkorn University. And when I say I'm kind of lucky to work with government and there are university, so you can negotiate the value. Even this land costs 700 million US. The land itself costs 700 million US, and the, the, the construction of the park is the park and the street that connect Rama first and Rama fourth is 30 million US. So, it's, but before this whole compound, like the big block of the city was look like this, and even right now. So there's so many toxic in the, the, the earth, and we have to deal with that as well. So this is the park, and you can see how flat we are as a city, and how gray we are as a city. So. I'm actually determined that this park shouldn't be just city beautification, but it should help the city deal with water and address some solution. Of course, we have to fix, fix this problem in the Delta system, but we just can't wait for the whole system to work until we act. So as a landscape architect, I convinced the committee that Chula should build something that give the city of the solution how we're going to deal with the water. And this is how it works. It's got three parts. It's got green roof, the biggest, one, the biggest one right now in Thailand, and the next biggest one is coming soon in two months. So this, we are so flat, so I incline the whole park to collect every drop of rain. So according to Dr. Sayeri research, I'm talking about the urban flood. I'm not even, I'm not mentioning yet about the coastal flood and then the river flood. That's another big problem, right? And so the whole park is inclined. And without the architecture, we actually have music in the park at, normally it's happened at Sun Room Park. Are you guys a big fan of music in the park? If yes. So there's many like people who work in the embassy go there. So right now, so room closed for some reason, they move it to this park. So this is the first year that I, people can understand that why the park is inclined, not only just for water, but it's inclined for the use of the people as an amphitheater. We don't have amphitheater in the park because all the park, all the park in Thailand are flat. So I think it's kind of give the sense of being a board, right? Sitting in the park, listen to the music. This is a very rare opportunity in, in Bangkok. So after every drops of rain fall down, collect in the water in the rain tank, some of the leftover runoff come through this wetland. And this is great, perfect ecology for kids to understand that this is all the water plants that used to that we used to see in our backyard or in the river or in the canal, right? We hardly know all these plants because we have no more canal left. And the lowest part is retention pond, which can double its size when the whole rain coming down and it's flood up to the slope. And people can bike and help clean the water so they ho understand the whole water system that it can be within that experience. And this is the street, of course, the first one that reduced the columns into the pedestrian with like a big green stripe as the rain garden that collect the flooding on the street to these plant, planting areas. Yeah, and it's four meters. So it's as big as the road. Yes, and the whole park, people just, why, you, why we have this park and Chula still flood? I just like, we are talking about the, s the scale of the flood, right? We are talking about the whole delta. And my small park, already big, but small park, couldn't help the whole system. 
but in itself is can collect a million gallons of water, which is a lot, which is mean 50 cycle year of rain. That's Dr. Um, uh, Seri have mentioned the cycle of rain. And normal infrastructure in Thailand, we don't even consider the rain cycle. The only infrastructure I can mention to you that uh, mention the period of the rain cycle is MRT sta station. You know, when you go into the MRT station, you have to go up and you have to go down. That stair, the, the height of the stair is 20 year rain cycle. So when it's rain less than 20 year, the system are safe. But more than 20 year, we need a big dam or bunker or things. So this is 50 years. Every infrastructure, and I'm talking about the green infrastructure, have limitation. So the next park, um, even do it bigger one, I kind of talked to Thammasat University, which Chula is just like the Harvard of Thailand. Thammasat is like Yale of Thailand. <laughs> so <laughs> let's compete Chula for a bigger <laughs> green roof. And yes, so this is the biggest one actually in Asia as having the green roof as an urban farming and something that of course we can beat Singapore. Just one, just one thing in green, about green. And this is, the, the concept is coming from the rice terraces. I think we have so much to learn from the resilience design from the past, how people live with the canal, how we are so amphibious as a culture or amphibious as a living. I don't think we have any problem when the flood come as, as, as Thai. I think we can survive. But the problem is the whole infrastructure doesn't make us resilient anymore. So I think there's so much to do with the infrastructure. And so that when it's rain, it's rain a lot and it's gonna rain more. It's gonna detour all this runoff and it's collect in the, um, the retention pond, four retention pond next to this building. So rather than have just normal building that we understand, block, wash out the runoff, throw to the road, we can slow down the runoff and create food. The next one is this infrastructure. No one probably not here in Thailand more than 30 years? No. Okay. This is a big infrastructure that was built. Maybe even I was one or two. And the wind of politics changed. So the, the road train of the sky train moved to Saturn that we are using right now. So this thing has left for 30 years with no one knows. And we have so many of this infrastructure, like these white elephants in Bangkok, if you can see something like unfinished as a monument and everywhere. I don't know why, but yes, it's happened more and more. So I think we should find a better idea to cooperate this infrastructure to benefit the city as a um, experience in this, the better city and also for the resilience design. So right now you can see this white thing. Congratulations to my team. We actually get this thing built with the BMA. And BMA is a very mystery, hard to work with. But sometimes when they want to push things, they can push really fast. But you can be, be sure that this project is out of corruptions and things because it moves so slow with a very low budget. <laughs> but it's happened now. So it's groundbreaking now and I don't know, this is probably my, my um, predict that the previous, the, we worked with previous mayor Sukhum Panbaripat and now there's a present mayor and he's gonna end his term soon. So he wanna get this thing finished before his end. So it's been rushed. Yeah, so I'm very scared of the design that they don't even consult me. <laughs> when they're built. And the other um, possibility, possibility is the helipad that hasn't been used at Rama Tipiti Hospital. They have a rumor that the princess never came. She just go to Sirirat, so this thing has been left and unused. So we convinced them to create more green space as an urban healing garden. Having all this thing help reduce urban heat island, um, 
preserve the um, energy in the buildings and of course create a social needs in in for the user yes we use trash all these plastic things that hospital produce every day as part of the design the nurse and the doctor this is government hospital they should relax a little bit and this is a this is not b and h or bangkok hospital this is ramatipati where's the pores and yes goes so the princess like very much this project and she gave the name the garden of happiness i also work with not just those who have budget the government budget but also the government budget that contrib contribute to the vulnerable community and i think the two most vulnerable community is the slum along canal they have no choice when it's flood they have to stay there for two or three months with all the trash very dirty and yes so we went with the students and bangkok have a new policy to enlarge all the canal to 33 meters and the problem i mentioned yesterday the department of canal is under the department of sewage so we see canal as sewage so we don't see canal as living things so the problem that you will see next time when you come to bangkok all the canal will have this 33 meters wide with no trees because it's in the right of way. I'm sad, but anyway. So we work very hard with community, come up with many solutions. Even the low budget project can actually create a better impact for the city. And we are talking about 7,000 households around the, along the Black Power Canal and even more. Some garden to absorb rain water, install the rain water tank in the house and right now the whole the first community was um gone to rebuild the new house and we even helped them save the existing tree which is i think it's you're not only just talking about the body of the community but you're talking about the soul of the community and it's actually these um green things the trees and also maybe just two minutes Oh, that's not clip videos. But anyway, this is the um, Hat Lake community and it's on the border of Thailand and Cambodia. And, oh, this is work. Okay, so, <laughs> hi. So actually, they are on the narrowest part of Thailand and they are Thai, but they have no right to stay. So when you fix the problem of climate change, you have touched so many other problems human right, equity, land, ri land right. So all these people have no right to stay because they invade the, land, the, the house into the ocean. And the problem now is we have 7,000 of this kind of fishermen village over Thailand and they are all illegal so we can negotiate with the government if we have a better this is the narrowest part of thailand so they cannot move upland because they're gonna hit cambodia so they have to move into the ocean and military government say move out you are this is not a permission for for you to stay so we with um community organization and also with the the villager negotiate with them that if you don't fix this problem that's mean every more seven thousand villager fishermen village in thailand would have to move like us so it's become a very issue that government have to solve rather than doing expel everyone and we're gonna lose so many the culture the food and where are these people gonna stay so we actually went there and give the presentation um the presentation with the village and then help them co-design and last two months 
we just got permission. This is the first village that got permission from Port Authority of Thailand to be able to build some structure in the ocean. But with that, we have to negotiate with creating more mangrove. Yes, and yes. And it's become the case study for the government to present at the UN Habitat Day last year. So we got some commitment from the government that they're gonna fix this thing. This is like ocean trash, all climate change issue that you, that you can think of is happened in very small scale. And with those who have no choice because they are poor. So the solution can come to the housing solution, the public space solution, building more mangrove. And this is the Hartley case study that they present to the world that they commit to do it. And I hope it's going to happen quite soon. Yes, so this is the solution. And this is another last project which is, if you can see from many people, speakers, diagrams, in 20 years, this area will be underwater. And I got to work in one of the medical hub. And the government invests 10,000 million bahts already. All, everything is done. But they forget to look at this map that in 20 years, <laughs> The sea level rise will come in 2.3 kilometers, right? Yes. And you can imagine this is 100 years, 50 years, 20 years. But I'm so sad that it's so little that we do to address this issue. So I went to experience myself and see all this infrastructure. And it's very dangerous if you boat out there because the infrastructure is underneath the boat and some tourists has been accident by putting the boat to see the shore, right? Because you don't understand what's underneath. And this is what happened with that temple. This is the temple in 1974, within one human life. Oops. Okay, right now, no, not right now, 1991. This is 2009, so you can see it looks like this right now. And stop eating shrimp <laughs> because all the mangroves have turned to be a shrimp farm. And we lose a best protection, natural protection. I don't into the great infrastructure, I'm into the green infrastructure. Build more mangroves right now, start from day one, like the village that they got permission, but they have to turn back all this mangrove to the land. And I think this thing can create some business model, but I'm not a business person, so I, ha I try to figure out how this work as well. What the green solution can create more money, some other country can buy the carbon from us. And this is how it looks like. But right now, we have a new temple higher and with the Buddha, Buddha have so many poles, right? And this is the new one. Stop sea level rise. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Koch. And, and I think, you know, you really hit on so many of the issues that we've been talking about tonight, but that we've also been talking about the past two days from everything from nature-based solutions to, you know, to governance, to rights-based approaches, to, um, to financing, and, 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 and I think it, it really encapsulated it there in, in some, really, um, some really powerful presentations. So thank you to all of our presenters. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're without one of them, but let's go straight to Q&A, and if you can ident uh, say your name and, and who you are with, um, and go to the microphone right there, that would be great. Uh, my name's Chris Bruton, I'm a member of the FCCT. Uh, I wondered whether your conference had addressed some of the really big issues that uh, this subject 
commands. Um, that, that is not so much the flooding of rivers, but rather the rising of sea levels, which has been addressed a little bit just now. Um, because the really big river deltas, like the Brahmaputra in, in Bangladesh, that's probably going to mean the necessary relocation of maybe a hundred over million people. Um, the, Me the Mekong Delta, which will also destroy much of the economic viability of Vietnam. And then countries, although they're not uh, your particular subject, like the, uh, uh, some of the island nations, which will have to relocate their populations altogether. I, I understand uh, one or two of them have been negotiating already with Australia to see whether they could just all move uh, to Australia um, or somewhere else uh, because the polar ice melting is inevitable and, and whatever we do about climate change it's going to happen. So uh, are these issues uh, been a major subject uh, for your discussions and, and if not how do you see the possible solutions arising? Um, I don't address the issue of Bangkok either. I, I live downtown in Bangkok and I know that where we are will will be submerged, but I guess I won't be alive to see it. I don't know whether that's good news or bad news, but uh, um, perhaps you could have a few words on, on these particular issues. Thank you. Should I have a go? Yes. Uh, yes, no, uh, you're absolutely right. There was uh, a lot of discussion. Uh, sorry? Yeah, speak up. Is that on? Maybe get closer. Hello. Yeah. So yes, thank you for the question. Um, uh, we do have a colleague here from uh, Bangladesh, if he's around, so he might be able to answer specifically. But yes, there was there was discussion about sea level rise. We didn't talk about the Pacific Island issues or the plight of uh, of the islanders, but we did talk about uh, the sea level rise in the context of some of the presentations about what are some of the solutions or or, or the things that uh, governments are looking at. Everything from hard infrastructure to some innovative solutions to the mangroves that we just mentioned about as well. So um, I think most of the conversation was uh, uh, more around the, um, uh, the solution side. It was focused on more on the, on the deltaic systems and, uh, and the issues around them upstream. But undoubtedly, uh, and I, and I look at some of my other colleagues here if they want to answer this specifically, but we did touch on it. There were many presentations. I mean, um, I remain somewhat... Uh, ill-informed about what the best ways forward are, and, and certainly what we saw were a mixture of some pretty aggressive construction offshore to divert tides and sands, and, uh, and I think some of the presentations were really about um, allowing sand to reaccumulate for mangroves to, to grow and to, uh, to start to build up in more natural ways the shorelines. Anybody else got any other comments? Can I share something? like? I think when people talk about the sea level rise problem, they fix, they easily fix with seawall, and I think that's very not adaptive solution because that's kind of defensive, and it's not about how you live with nature. And when I say adaptation, it doesn't mean I'm giving up on emission strategy, but I think adaptation have to come because we have to live with the flow or we have to dance with climate change right now so adaptation have to come and many people mentioned about Dutch solution who's from Netherlands okay oh my gosh oh hi <laughs> I think Netherlands have like this seawall system and I think that Delta is very different and and they have the fight with the North Sea which in the winter, you can die if you you touch that water. But in Thailand, if, yes, it's cold, right? But in Thailand, we swim in the flood. The floods mean food and things. And many people try to fix this sea level rise by applying this Dutch seawall. And there are some study in the pillars on um, politics and research. And I think it was crazy. I think it's very applicable and it's very um, practical in Netherlands, but not in Gulf of Thailand. Because if you build the dam, and our river is so wide, and our Gulf is so big, and if you build the dam, this, you're gonna create a big spoil of water. 
we have wetland we have so many like beach and so many things so uh, there's so many dangers try to jump into fix all this problem by apply this great infrastructure that work well in many other developed country to my country and i think we have to be very careful because with dealing with delta and delta is a living thing so you don't fix living things with a fixed solution yes Okay. Yep. Uh, do we have any other questions? We did not discuss a crocodile mitigation strategy, by the way. So, um, um, yeah. More questions? Yes. Yes. Our, our friend from uh, Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Good evening. Um, Robert Kinnear, Alternative Innovations. I happen to be a water engineer amongst my various other little strings in my bows. Um, sorry, I didn't catch your name, but you're the urban designer. I loved your designs. Um, I've had a design since the flooding in uh, of 11, what, nine years ago now. Uh, I call it the uh, river catchment flood prevention system, which I've been touting around government departments and AIT and Chula and, 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 so everybody knows about it, probably here as well, have heard me talk about it. But anyway, your design, I'm delighted you got awards for it. My design actually incorporates just about everything that your small little pockets incorporate. But instead of just being, you're at the end of the system, my, my design actually incorporates the entire system. That's why it's called River Catchment Flood Prevention System. So all the great rivers, I forget all the names, the Ping, the Wang, the, what's the Non, the Ying, uh, oh, Yang or something, I forget all the big rivers. If you imagine that as a tree and all the tributaries, then the problem is you're trying to deal with the water down at the end of the line. The, the place to deal with the water is at the top of the line, where the water falls. If you keep it up there, then it doesn't get down to the bottom and create flooding. So, you, you, the first time I've heard these words used, retention ponds, you called them, or whatever they were, that's exactly what my system is, is retention reservoirs, not dams, but offset from the river system. Mm -hmm. Now with wind and solar and all that kind of stuff, we've got technology, these retention reservoirs can be anywhere, because you can pump the water up to there, you don't have to be gravity fed like in the old days. It's a very simple system in concept. The only problem is it's a very large system. A tree with all these leaves on it transfer the leaves to retention reservoirs. Uh, how many leaves does a big tree have? Half a million? A million? So you're needing half a million retention reservoirs. And they have to be built and constructed properly and correctly, not just like they bulldozed a bunch of earth and nine years ago and walked along the top and said, we've defended Bangkok, you know, with a pile of dirt that'll just wash away with the next flood. When you, you know how dams are built, I'm sure, without going to the technical aspects of it, they have to be built in that kind of construction, an earth embankment with uh, clay impervious zones, you know, the whole, the whole works without going into any great detail. That can be done. You develop the infrastructure, you create the retention reservoir, insurance suddenly collapses, goes down, because guess what? You've prevented the flood system. You've allowed in investment to come into the country. You where the retention reservoirs, reservoirs are, you develop the infrastructure, you create jobs. I also work in the oil and gas industry. We drill wells in 15,000 feet of water to 20 or 30,000 feet below seabed. High temperature, high pressure. This is at 350 degrees at 20,000 PSI. Guess what? We can manage that. With transducers, information going up to satellite, coming down to central control system, and with all <laughs> oil and gas industry, it's got amazing technology that people don't, aren't aware of. All the, we've got water falling at atmospheric temp pressure running down the hill. Now, if we can deal with 350 degrees 
uh, temperature at 20,000 PSI in the oil industry, I guess we can deal with water at atmospheric pressure running down a hill. It's not difficult. Look at your uh, tsunami warning system, right? You've got transducers. Go okay, never mind the flaws. People switch things off. I know that. <laughs> but assuming it's all switched on and working, these transducers send a signal up to a satellite, come down to central control, control system that sends out warnings, off go the alarms, and people get out of the way. With these transducer systems incorporated into your retention reservoir, you can open and shut valves, you can send signals to guys with a mobile phone and say, go and check this is opening and shutting correctly. With a fully integrated water control system, integrating all your water departments, your hydrology, your irrigation, and all this stuff, it's a very simple process, and nobody's doing it. They're all building huge infrastructure to dump water. Now, this isn't dealing with, pardon me, you're talking about your deltas here, I'm not. <laughs> but if you reduce, take out all this water that's coming downhill, then your sea level problem is more manageable because you're only dealing with the sea level as opposed to the flood water coming down. A very simple and non-technical analogy, Songkran. Every day we're flooded with cars. What happens in Songkran? Everybody goes up country. Where do they park the cars? Outside their house, up in the hills, up in the mountains. What happens to Bangkok? No flooding of cars. Keep the cars where they are up there. That same, keep the water up there. Then you've got no flooding. So if you've got all this wonderful connection that you've got, please try and incorporate this river flood prevention, this uh, river catchment flood prevention system. It's the same as what you're doing, but on a national scale. Thailand is so lucky because all its big rivers are within its political boundaries. So you can, Thailand can do this without seeking help or um, support from other countries, like Mekong is five countries or whatever. You know. So Thailand could do this and then export this technology globally. Thank you. I'm a little cautious of the time here. Did, did, did you have a question? Or? Yep. Uh, can you incorporate that, please? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's for you. Well, I think the first thing is we need to change the dam's names because it's our names in monarchy names. <laughs> so to start the settlement to come down, I think we... It's, it takes some time for us to get smart that we build a dam in the wrong direction, right? The river run like this, we build in this way, rather than we have to build parallel, so we create rooms for water, that's what you mentioned, and let the water flow. But right now, we build it this way, and it's all named by kings, and it's all named by princess, and very big king, and I think to destroy that system. I don't really worry about the solution we will create in our generation. I think we can do it. But it's so hard to destroy whatever has been done and create us even more problems. That's my concern. Thank you. I think to, just to echo that, I think one of the challenges is that we're very much feeling a way through this era. That the technology we've been using has been driven through industrial revolution and now we're into a green ecological revolution and we don't understand the connectivity of you do this over here and what does it do over there. And the other thing that struck me in the conference in the last day or so is the different elements that are required. It's not a single solution and you need multifunctional support. We've talked a lot about financing, talked a lot about technology, talked a lot about bringing different ideas together. And that's what's gonna be required. It has to be integrated, otherwise you do one thing and you end up with a result, an, un a, an unexpected result somewhere else. And so that's why I was there really today, was ex explaining about what my industry can bring because it, it means multiple inputs so we create sustainable solutions that we, um, that we understand how all those things come together. I think we're very much at the beginning of that journey, quite honestly. Great, thank you. Yes. Elaine Kurtenbach, oh. Associated. Associated Press. Um, just a couple of really quick directed questions. Uh, one for Stuart about Vietnam and the Mekong Delta. Uh, is there any active 
effort to resolve that issue because I know it's a really severe problem. It, I, conditions are deteriorating really quickly there. And uh, about Thailand, with regard to the shrimp farms and the mangroves, um, do you see any hope of that turn, the tide turning in favor of the mangroves given the way things have gone the wrong way for a long time? Yep. Thank, thank you for your question. I am actually going to ask my colleague who lives in the Mekong Delta <laughs> to answer that question. <laughs> This is Mark Goishou. He's the Greater Mekong Freshwater Lead for WWF. So thank you for the question. I, I can maybe at the same time attempt to also add uh, elements of response to the first question. Uh, we, we, we're looking specifically to deltas, and, and as you said, deltas are living things. So when you are sitting on the coast in a delta, you see the level of the water compared to what it was before. Uh, we have to look at what is relative elevation. So sea level is rising, and that's a fact, it, it is happening. But what is happening, and we have a gentleman in the back, Philip, who has the, done a lot of work on, on, on that subject. What is happening is actually the, the land is sinking three to five times faster than sea level is. So the result is the same for a household living on the, on the bank of the, uh, on, on the coast. But the, uh, uh, the processes behind it are different. So if you want to uh, understand this, this impact and, 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 and uh, address it, you have to understand the system and understand those processes that, that are happening. So sea level is rising. We can uh, uh, implement the Paris Accord and, 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 and work on it, but it's long term. Even if we stop our emission by tomorrow, the, the, result will, will take a long, the, the, the processes will take a very long time to stop the sea level raise. But the uh, sinking of the deltas uh, are a different issue. And uh, so th that's the bad news. The good news is that uh, it, the process is a bit easier to, uh, to address than, 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 than the emission. There's some uh, natural process that you have to understand. So there's a big pile of sand and, and, and mud that uh, is accumulated by the river. So the natural process uh, is that you have to understand those, those processes that, that stop. Climate change uh, is not new. The new is that it is human induced. We have paleo studies that demonstrate that uh, if, w when, when sea level rise was much faster, if deltas are well fed in sediment, they can build themselves above sea level in, in a natural manner. Uh, so if you do keep the sediment processes uh, as they used to be or increase them, then, then you, can, you, you can keep yourself above sea level. But a process that is uh, causing the, the, the sinking is also the pumping of water from the level. So it's pretty simple if you take some cubic meters of whatever matter, water, from, from uh, the system, then it sinks. So that's something that you can do immediately and, 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 and address. So that's, those are the physical uh, solutions that you can look into. For the delta to the last question, uh, what is happening? The government of Vietnam is very aware that uh, the deltas are sinking and shrinking. Uh, they're aware of the loss of elevation. They're also aware of uh, erosion and, and uh, entire provinces. Actually, six out of uh, the 13 provinces of the Delta have declared state of emergency or some emergency measures to address the erosion. The prime minister has, uh, uh, has signed a declaration and is working now with its uh, different ministries on, on, uh, uh, on an action plan behind it. So with the different the, the limitations uh, of, of uh, the means, they are aware in acting about it and, and asking for all support to do it. So there are solutions, in short, there are solutions. There's a governance will. There are technical solutions that are integrated. We can spend a lot of time discussing which is the worst, uh, which is, is pumping of water more important than reduction of sediment. It's a useless debate. I think they're all important, and I think uh, the meeting factor is what could we do with our, with, with our limited means to address all of them and, 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 and address the cumulative impacts they have. So the good news is that it is, in principle, possible to reduce the, the, uh, uh, some of those processes, but it's a huge undertaking, and it will require transformative collaboration with many players and all working together. So that's, I think, uh, 
central to the discussions we had over the past two days uh, on how we could leverage transformative uh, solutions to work and put everything we have to this uh, uh, huge issue as, as the first slides from, uh, from uh, uh, still 400 million people at risk uh, of, of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, being exposed to more uh, floods, to more uh, salt intrusion, uh, water supply, more exposure to, uh, uh, to natural disasters. Hundreds of millions, hundreds of thousands of people die uh, of, of typhoons. It, it's not a small issue. So there are solutions. There's political will, but there's still a huge undertaking ahead of us to transform this into, into action and, 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 and curve the, uh, the uh, impacts. Thank you. Any further questions? Or any additional comments, yes? Um, quick about shrimp farm. I think it's, it's become like we export shrimp to the world, maybe top three. And I think it's very hard to just like, okay, stop shrimp farm and go mangrove. But I think it can be the way that we can find those things to e evolve together, like not maximize the shrimp farm, but also create the ecology that the community can be part of it because we are losing our last boundary. And if the sea level rise higher than one dam of the shrimp farm, that means we lose the land 100 meters because the shrimp farm is like so long that every step, that means we lose 100 meters land. Yes, but I don't think we can delete and just do 100% shrimp farm. But yes, the first thing we have to make government recognize first, which is really hard. We have so many distract things about politics and, um, so yes. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, I think we'll, uh, we'll thank our panelists, uh, Koch, Stuart, Mark, Peter. Um, thank you all for, uh, for joining us and thank you all for joining us as well.